<laughs> it's okay. Um, so we may not get done today. There's a good chance we probably won't get through chapter seven unless I just go lightning fast. And that's with the exclusion of two of the case studies. So this chapter seven is like very dense and Emil just responded to kind of my agony when uh, trying to work through these problems of how memory intensive these examples are. So I just responded saying that um, I, I wish I had known that <laughs> before trying, literally wasting hours um, because the data that is in the book was like, I guess at the time of writing, I either he manipulated it or I don't know, but he only had like 117,000 records. And then when I pulled the data, it was 2.5 million records. And like every single section, you're basically doing the entire modeling procedure over and over again. And the first one, just with the plain binary classifier, like naive Bayes, it does, it did not, it could not, my computer could not. Um, it crap my like our session would just abort. And that was just like on a single core. If I had more time or, or like more interest for this particular thing, I would have like tried to figure out how to paralyze this task. But I know this was just like a simple example and public and it like throughout the chapter, you see that this is not the like the best model to use for this classification type problem. So I was like. I literally wasted so much time. I'm like crying. I'm like, if I can't do this, it won't freaking knit. Yeah. So I don't know if any of you guys attempted working through this chapter. Um, it was a little painful. And I think I have a pretty decent machine. Like I, my, my MacBook has 64 gigs of RAM and a really fast processor. But I also don't know how to do and he does mention in the book, like, like attempt parallelization. Um, but I've never had to do it in the context of an R markdown notebook. So I really don't know how to go about that. Um, it's just been in an R script. So maybe like on the side, but anyways, I'm actually just stalling because my notebook, my R markdown is still knitting. <laughs> it's been knitting for a hot minute. So while we wait for it, I'm just going to share with you my uh, code and then we can just go, we can go through it. Um, I go through it like that. Does that, does that sound okay? Yeah, whatever. Sounds good. Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> Hi. All right. And here we go. Where's my second desktop? Oh, this is my first. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, so I, I, my... I think it's a good idea I did in the last chapter also just to trim down the data set to take some subset. That is how I was able to knit the animal, but it was taking forever and even it even crashes uh, in one chapter uh, just in <laughs> computer. So like, it's really, really tasking the job, yeah. Yeah, I, I, um... I really hope he like includes like a bot like one of the like the the or the boxes of text that in between you know other chunks of text that's like a warning this um data set is like 1.5 gigabytes it will take like 14 hours like the workflow for that data set was 12 gigs 12 gigabytes and so I was like, the, 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 yeah, and he, he literally said like 14 hours to, try, <laughs> to uh, fit that model. So, okay, anyways, let's start from the top. So the data set that we are working with is, oh, this chapter is about classification um, with obviously textual data and learning how to te uh, classify whether um, or not uh, a particular, um, piece of text is related to a certain product. Um, the data set that we're working with is uh, complaints data. Um, oh, 
sorry, before I get there, if just like a little primer regression usually gives you like a best fit line through all your data points. Classification gives you um, this uh, separation between groups. So it's it's more uh, flexible, I guess. It was really nice of the data to kind of move out of the way of that squiggly line, the classification. Like the data was kind of like, all right, we'll move, we'll move to the side. Yeah. It was very considerate of them. Yeah, also very those, considerate. I was going to ask um, you how you, I saw that you didn't make those in GGPOT, but my God, I think those are really nice looking. Yeah, I, no, totally um, I straight up pulled this from this site. All right, I'm going to have to figure out how to do that in GGPOT. Anyway, yeah, I'm sure there, there are ways, but not something that I wanted to get into. I just wanted to make it clear. Um, yeah, I have a question. So um, this classification, um, so when you say regression here and classification, why do you say that? Like, is it best line of it? Because like regression can make this kind of plot that we have in classification, like when we have complex model, like, uh, uh, n cube or i mean x um yeah complex model even if it is regression can it um it can fit a model not a best line of it like trying to fit the data very well right well we typically don't use regression when we have an outcome where you are trying to identify what groups certain um certain features belong in, right? So for logistic, you could have like a binary outcome, but really you're trying to predict uh, the likelihood of set outcome, like, you know, one or zero being like, will die, will not die. So something like this. Um, but with classification problems, you're really trying to like, <clears throat> you're really trying to classify groups of observations and like kind of bucket them. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just move on, yeah. Okay, so the data that we're working with is the consumer complaint database. There are complaints about financial products and services. So you go to, there's a link for it. I put a comment, it's a large file. And it's different than how the book, the format's different than how the book um, uh, represents it. So I just ran janitor clean names. So the data actually in raw form comes in with all like the variable names, um, uppercase and all that stuff. So to make it consistent with examples, that's what I did. And after a lot of trial and error with not getting this thing to run, I actually just stripped it down to 200,000 observations, which I'm actually thinking I probably should have just done like 10,000 um, because I was trying to get similar to what Emil had, which was he ended up having like 117,000. So I was like, okay, well maybe 200,000 was fine. It's actually doing better, but still it's actually taking a long time. Like it's, you can see right here in my, um, out, but it, it's still at 38%. It's in section four. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. So, uh, yeah. So I made a note since this chapter was written, the number of observations rose from 170,000 to 0.5 million. So the outputs may differ slightly. So our first classification model is very simple. The goal is to predict if a complaint is referring to a credit report, like re referring to credit reporting, credit repair services, or other personal reports. And we have our outcome variable is going to be product that we will transform into a binary variable with levels credit or other. And our explanatory variables is just going to be the consumer complaint narrative. So there is a variable in the data set that basically has the the chunk of text that the consumer wrote complaining about said product. So um, if we, we could look at, you know, kind of what the narratives look like, want to note that there are a lot of complaints that have no narrative. There are a lot of NAs. 
So I actually kind of uh, removed that also. So let's bring in tidy models. We set the seed. Uh, and then we turn our outcome, which is product. Um, first, we condense them. So we basically aggregate anything that is credit reporting, credit repair services, or other personal consumer reports into something into the group, into the class credit. Otherwise, classify it as other and then convert that to a factor. Um, and then uh, I went ahead and I just, for further like stripping of data, I was like, let me just drop where we have NAs for the, where we have no narrative for the complaints. Otherwise, because in my, in my head, it doesn't, it's not gonna serve us any purpose except making um, this, this modeling much more time intensive. Um, so when I actually do drop NAs for the consumer complaint variable, I was able to reduce um, observations from 200,000 to 74,000. Um, all right, so now we have 74,000 records and we are going to split our data on our transformed variable product. product. Uh, so we do we use out of tidy models, the initial split function for that and then Given our split, we run training and testing functions, which I think by default it does a 75-25 split, because when you look at the dimensions of each of these um, data sets, that's what you get. And if you run the proportions like roughly 25-75, so I leave as is, then we're going to pre-process. So last chapter, Justin kind of introduced us to the text recipes. Um, package. And in the text recipes package, there are certain steps that you can add to a tidy models recipe that are specific for text. So the first thing I do, I remove the complaints original data set. It was taking too much. It's like 1.5 gigs, like I already told you. I remove that, load the text recipe, and then we start to build the recipe by first initiating a recipe. So when you initiate a recipe with if uh, for any of you, you that are familiar with tidy models, um, you initiate the recipe, pass in what you're, um, what you're modeling. So we have product as our outcome and just consumer complaint narrative as our predictor. Then we are going to tokenize. We're gonna to use step tokenize on the narrative then filter. So we only want to get the most, uh, the top 1,000 most frequent tokens from the narrative to like strip out any noise. And then calculate TF IDF. So there's a step TF IDF on that narrative. So we've built our recipe. Then the second step in most tidy models workflow uh, processes is building a workflow. So once you have, um, built a recipe, then you wanna initiate a workflow and then in which you add the recipe. So you, we have this thing called complaint workflow where we initiate a workflow and then we add the recipe that we just built. You could in theory like do this in a step, this is cleaner. So I will leave it like this. Then for our first model, we're gonna utilize something uh, a type of classifier called naive Bayes. Um, and for those that, you know, for you guys that may not uh, remember what a naive Bayes classifier is, it's a classification technique based on Bayes theorem with an assumption of independence among predictors. So this algorithm uses the probability of an event already occurring, like an event that has already occurred to estimate the, uh, the probability of an event occurring. <laughs> so let me just remind you, so the Bayes probability um, equation here, you have the conditional probability of F given E. This is known as your posterior probability is given by probability of E given F, right? This is your likelihood times P of F, your prior probability, then uh, all divided by the probability of E, which is your evidence. So this is kind of um, where you say that this 
event has already occurred. So this is our evidence. And then we have uh, the likelihood of that event given a condition times uh, whatever the condition, the probability of that condition is to get the, the posterior probability. So it's almost sometimes, you know, the way I see it, it can be kind of, it can be thought of reversing conditional probability. So you can kind of work backwards sometimes. And if we, any of you guys are familiar with the, you know, in your basic probability class, having to draw out those tree diagrams, right? When you have one probability, you know, this probability and you can just like, you know, given conditions, this is how you kind of taught conditional probability. It's kind of working backwards, like working down the tree or like starting with the the end of the tree at the beginning and then working your way up. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it's used when you need the probability of an event E conditional on event F, but you only know the probability of F conditional on E. So something that has already occurred. But what makes it naive is the assumption that this exact conditional probability, the probability of F given E, of um, a vector of prediction, a, a vector of predict predictors, sorry, is sufficiently well estimated by the product of the individual conditional probability. So when you have a lot of predictors, this denominator actually ends up being, you know, product rule, like with probabilities, you, it actually ends up being like a lot of probabilities um, together. Um, and uh, so, by doing that, by doing that product, by you know multiplying one one um, probability times another probability, that assumes independence. So we are basically saying that these events are mutually exclusive, and that's what kind of makes this approach naive. Um, and then for those of you that are you know interested in understanding further, given like a you know a real like uh, worked out example, I've included a link that I found really helpful. Um, for programming uh, naive bays. Um, but basically, it's used because it's easy, it's fast, and it performs really well in these kind of classification, um, particularly multi class predictions. So, in our case, we do have a discrete feature vector. So, we can assume that each complaint is independent, so that each complaint is not dependent on another complaint. So we're going to use naive Bayes. So the first thing we're going to do um, after we have already made our recipe and our workflow that contains the recipe, the next step in tidy models is specify our engine, right? This is the model that we intend on using. Um, so we initiate from the scrim package naive Bayes and then set mode, which is a classification and the engine is going to be naive Bayes. So this is what's called um, in the tidy models framework, the specification. So we have NB as naive Bayes specification. And so it re basically returns naive model specification, computational engine is gonna be naive Bayes. So the last step in this, uh, in this kind of modeling phase is fitting our, um, our data. So we take our workflow and we add the model. So we use add model function to um, utilize uh, the specification that contains, you know, what engine and type of problem that we have, and then use the fit function on our training data. So we're going to fit this model to our training data. And this is where I said, warning, this outcome, <laughs> this output is greater than 12 gigabytes, but now it, it, it's, it's not, but it's still something like 90 something megabytes. It's pretty large, um, which kind of makes sense because our feature vector is very large. They're words, right? They're tokens versus, you know, a more traditional uh, machine learning algorithm like or data set. Um, so the way we're going to evaluate this is we are going to use um, cross validation. We're going to use k-fold cross-validation, particularly on um, our training set. So essentially, I think by default, this creates 10 folds. Um, and so once we have our, um, our folds, 
um, which basically it's like it, it's the folds are 10 um, versions of our training set um, where I think the threshold, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, it's like 90% uh, Ninety percent of the data is used for sampling of that of that particular fold. Something like this. I can't remember. Um, so this is how we are able to validate. All right. So and finally, sorry. What's the ninety percent? Um, the cable the, for the cross validation, the cross validations, each of the flow, uh, sorry, folds, <clears throat> each of the folds that are created. So this ends up, this step creates 10 versions of our training data, essentially. So I can tell you, I mean, just, I was, uh, I was trapped. No, oh, okay, fold. Um, I mean, just to pipe in I have, I have two quick comments uh one about the the k fold stuff so right so if it's it's tenfold and it's using 90 percent of the training set as a training set and kind of saying like hey the other 10 percent is going to be a validation set oh yeah and it just does that 10 times with uh 10 different and mutually exclusive uh sections of the data. So, but one of the things that I, I wanted to, <laughs> that I found very bizarre about this chapter that's actually not about classification per se, I, it's kind of a pedagogical question or workflow question, I guess, is, so right now we're doing this um, K-fold validation so that we can like see how a model does. I think this title, uh, this section is titled Evaluate Your Model. But so what you were talking about earlier, uh, was like how this model is like, you know, at one point it was 12 gigabytes for you. Uh, the one, if you scroll up, you'll see, I'm sure you have nightmares about it. So maybe you don't want to scroll up. Um, <clears throat> but so if I'm not mistaken, nothing ever gets done with that model. And I thought that was like one of the most bizarre things. In the yes. Topic. Oh my God, but Justin, this... I had this same like conundrum. I was like, why did we make this model and not even use it? Cause we end yeah. up like, um, making um, like uh, changes and assigning a new, uh, creating a new workflow and then refitting again. So I'm like, why did we, why did I waste like an hour on this, you know, naive base fit, this fitted model and not even use it. But in theory, in theory, uh, you could just take this, right? And then you could get, you could do the cross validation and then pull the metrics as like you normally would. But that part was like skipped entirely because of, as I'm about to get to um, in a bit, some other changes that we're going to be adding. So that was a little bit of a pain in the neck that we don't end up using NB fit. Something that was very computationally expensive doesn't even get used. Yeah, well, although I'm actually yeah. more pessimistic than you, uh, I don't. You can't really do anything with it. I mean, you, what you would do is fit it. You just like check out its performance on the test set and call it a day. I mean, because you didn't use the uh, the resampling uh, function, right? Like the fit resamples. Ah, since you didn't fit the right, resamples, right. you, you could, really can't do anything. With you that would just use the test set exactly, and then call it a day. Anyway, so. Yeah, that's actually yeah, I just wanted to commiserate with you there for a second. No, so I, I really appreciate it. And I really I actually really do because I like I pulled a few hairs because I like I literally thought my eyes were you know going cross because I kept looking at the screen and I like command F and it was like NB fit. That's the only place where we kind of use it. And so I'm glad I wasn't, I'm not the only one that noticed this. So, all right, um, moving forward. So um, I just checked, 
you're right, Justin, it's 90% of the training data goes into each of the folds and 10% is held out um, for evaluation. I wasn't sure if I had the percentage right. So now we are going to create another workflow. Um, this is workflow two. Um, this is called naive. This is particular to the naive base um, where we add a recipe and the uh, naive base specification. Um, but when you look at the, where is the, the first workflow? Yeah. So the first workflow is really just has our recipe that has the transformations that we make on our data, right? And then we basically pass that um, into our, this, this NB fit thing. So that doesn't have, um, we have that workflow, we include the model, but hold on. How is this different? Now that I look at it, how is this different than the, what makes this different than the? Uh... I think they just created a new workflow now. You could have done an update model or update spec, sorry. But they just created a new one with the workflow uh, bracket. Because we have, because when we fit, we include the spec here. And this contains all the transformations. We add the model, we utilize the training data. This workflow is initiated. We include the recipe with all the transformations. And we include the model for the naive base specif specifications. So I really don't see what the big difference is in this one. I think it's just an extra workflow. Did they use the same model and spec, or sorry, model and recipe? Because I think they just skipped, uh, since they piped the fit in, like they just didn't have that object available to reuse. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. That's a good point. Um, the previous workflow didn't have the model in it. So it was done like on a separate step. So this kind of, I think, just combines it all into one. Um, whereas the other one, they put it with the fit, like when you were fitting the model. Okay, so now that we have that new workflow, um, we are going to use the fit resamples, as Justin previous, previously mentioned, to fit the model to each of the folds. So this takes a long time um, because you have 10 uh, folds and um, yeah. Um, oh, and then, there is a argument here for safe predictors equals uh, predictions equals true safe pred. This is for so that we can so it stores um, the evaluation metrics like the performance metrics um, that so that we can call it using the collect metrics function, which we're going to do. Um, and, and the thing is that a lot of these steps, I mean, the fact that I don't have the actual arm. Um, the R markdown rendered is actually not a big deal because there isn't really output for a lot of these steps. It's just code. <laughs> um, where there is though, is kind of uh, these metrics um, where you can see what the, uh, the ROC values are, but it's okay. When we actually plot it, the ROC curve, so we, we group by each fold, so each fold is a different color. And then we have our sensitivity and specificity or one minus specificity. Um, and then we have our like uh, chance line right here, like this diagonal. Um, you can see that the model performs pretty well. Like it's, it's pretty, each of the folds are pretty like far from this line, which is what we want. We can go one step further and then actually look at the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix here is going to tell us how well our um, classifier predicted the truth, right? So you usually have here your 
um, true positive, true negative, or whatever it's going to be. Um, and then your false positive and false negative. Um, sorry, this is false positive and this is false negative. Um, so it's not bad. It correctly predicted other very well. Um, actual credit, it, it's also darker, but I mean, there is still a lot that were misclassified. That's a good proportion that were misclassified. Um, and then we move on to this section where we compare to null, um, a null model. And Justin talked about this last week, um, where we have this concept of kind of a baseline model that really just performs math. Like that's the best way I can kind of describe it. It's like it's like 50-50, like the the the, the performance uh, metrics. So you have like your ROC or whatever is 0.5, um, which up here for this one, if I recall correctly, it was pretty good. I think it was like 0.93 or something like this. Um, at least in the book, it was. I I don't remember what it was for this particular one with the trimmed out data. And then obviously differ a little bit. So the way we um, we build a null model is that we oh goodness I don't like this literally at sixty seven percent. Okay, so is we call on from tidy models this uh, null model function. So it initiates a null model, and then we set the engine and mode to be classification and the engine to be from parsnip. Um, I don't know particularly why. Um, first, I guess maybe just make it ambiguous. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what this means that engine and parsnip. If I have um, to guess, it would be that so, you know, engine is usually like the, um, yeah. the particular like GLM net or mm -hmm. Keras or whatever. And Wait, my guess it. is that, yeah. Oh, yeah, engine, or, or like Ranger or yes, like yes, what, yes. Like, so my guess is just that no actual, oh, I guess that sounds mean. I mean, I know like pre existing package or library is going to contain a null model because why? <laughs> Why would they? So they, the creators of Parsnip, had to create a null model. My, my, my guess is that if you were to like do question mark null model to get the help file, it's actually probably a redundant step. I would imagine that the default for null model is Parsnip. Anyway, that's just my um, I have a question here, Leila. What's up? Yeah. So uh, the question is about this null model. So for example, in scikit-learn, um, Python in scikit-learn, we do have like a, what is called dummy classifier. And the dummy classifier, it does not learn anything. It does not have any relationship with the futures. Um, what it does is like, it has some kind of argument, like uh, maybe uh, some parameter that you can say to classify based on the uh, most, uh, uh, maybe um, futures that occur most often. So sometimes if we want to build a base model, we find a mean uh, to serve as a base. So this null model, what it is doing, is it learning? Is it calculating the mean? Does it have some kind of parameters that we can impute to specify how the null model can calculate the base, such as mean or some stuff like that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, to be quite honest, I never got a chance to actually like fully run this step <laughs> because of how long the prior steps were, um, were taking me to actually investigate, but just looking at it, um, we have a uh, we're passing in the recipe from the complaints recipe 
which contains like those transformation steps. And then our model is just a null classification model. Now I don't know, um, and we, we, we do our resamples with the, the, the folds from the training data. It, the only way to answer this is to kind of look at the help for null model to see mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, I guess it's not learning anything, the null model. Maybe it's just like trying to pick the most um, occurrence or some, um, some sampling stuff. Yeah, I don't know. You can yeah, see right here, like chip. 0.5 is our ROC and uh, accuracy uh, metrics. So I just did question mark null model, and it says it learns the largest class model, so most occurrence. Yeah, OK. So it's basically the Doesn't largest. Really learn anything. Yeah, it would you know always what? predict the largest class. Yes, exactly, yes, yeah. yes, exactly, yeah. Exactly. So um, in scikit learn demi classifier, there are several parameters that you can pass to the model. For example, to uh, select the most occurrence one, there are different kind of argument that you can select. So this one, I think by default as, uh, is taking the largest one. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So there isn't any learning here. So this is not like machine learning. This null model is not like machine learning. It, there is no correlation between the futures and the target. It is not just learning. So it's just demi, right? I think that's so. How, yeah, that's how I would think about it. Because it, it's really there just to um, kind of use as a hori uh, heuristic to from which to compare. Yeah. So, so like what if about you were just like if like you're if you were to just take cost like like the my mental model is if I were to just, you know, given this complaint predict the most uh, prevalent um, product, that would be, uh, it, does your model perform better than that? Does that make sense? <laughs> the model that you're yeah. actually trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a good um, way I guess the whole chance thing, but it's actually using the, in the classification, it's gonna use the, the most prevalent class. Okay, um, thank you. You're welcome. So also I, also, I gave a heads up to you guys, uh, Sham, you, I don't think you were connected yet, um, that there's a pretty good chance we're not gonna get through this chapter today, um, but it is what it is. So now how- Yeah, no worries. Um, we can continue next week. Okay. So we have the next section goes into um, what's called a lasso classification model. So what is lasso classification? It's basically a regularized linear model with variable selection. So it's like lasso, it's lassoing variables. That's how I kind of think about it. Um, this is a fun fact. Uh, my former boss at UM actually used to, so Tip Sharani at Stanford, who I think developed Lasso, um, when Ross worked, was I think his student. So it was kind of cool. Um, then what is a regularized, okay, but what's a regularized linear model? Is a type of linear regression where the coefficients are essentially constrained to zero. Um, and, means why basically to reduce the risk of overfitting by discouraging your model from learning uh, the noise. So like basically creating some complex model that is unnecessary. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna pull my hair. I also had this really weird error today when I was trying to build, um, knit my our markdown. This was before yesterday or today. I can't remember at this point. It was like earlier in the, I think I was in, still like trying to get past chapter one in my knitting. And it gave me like in the fit um, for that um, NB fit uh, object, gave me something called a, um, stack imbalance error. 
And that like freaked me out. Like, I don't know what this means. I looked on GitHub. I've never encountered this error before. And I found somebody that mentioned on GitHub as an issue, but I could not really make sense of anything this person was saying. <laughs> so this chapter has been causing me a lot of problems. Uh, this function was not run with the blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is something I can probably easily fix. Um, okay, sorry, tangent. Um, oh, it took me to the actual RMD, right? Let's get back to right, regularized linear models. So basically, we want to constrain the coefficients of a, of a linear model to zero so we can avoid the risk of overfitting, like I was saying. Um, you don't want to have a complex model for like an unnecessary complex model that's that learns on a lot of noise. So anything that you know, we basically penalize the um, certain features uh, to see how we can get uh, the features that are contributing more. So I basically, so I wrote here, lasso regression can be useful in cutting down many features. So it helps us choose a simpler modeling by penalizing the features. So we only select some of the features out of the high dimensional space of possible tokens. So tokens are features in this case, just a reminder. So let's lasso. Um, this one is going to be calling on logistic regression um, because we have our- um, Question. Mm -hmm. Um, so lasso can be used as future selection model to uh, as for supervised learning. Say that again. I said, does that mean uh, uh, lasso can be used as future selection model and now use the future selected for like, somehow like for supervised learning? Yeah, that's correct, I think, depending on your penalty and mixture uh, hyperprinters. Yeah. Yeah, actually that's a really good that's a really good observation, yeah. Um that's it for you. Uh, yeah, you could yeah, use this as a way to do feature selection. Mm, okay. Gotcha. All right. So, we're going to set an arbitrary penalty uh 0 0.01. And we're going to use our GLM net engine uh for this. Um so when you see the spec, you get your penalties set to 0 0.01 uh, and your computational engines from JLM and net. Um, and then we develop our workflow. So a lot of this is you know, starting to become cookie cutter. So we have our workflow, we initiate it, we add the recipe, which is our initial recipe that we developed. And then we add our lasso spec model. And so when we look at our workflow, we get that our um, model is going to be doing logistic regression. We have three steps to uh, for pre-processing and that we have our penalty set to 0 0.01. So all we have to do right now is fit it. Um, so we use the fit resamples method with save predictor, predictor is equals true um, and using the same folds that we have created, the 10 fold, uh, the 10 folds. So when we actually run that, um, we get uh, actually a little bit better. Uh, we get better um, ROC values. So you can actually look at it um, and it's not saved here, so I can't show it to you, but let's see if I move my, I get the book. I can show it to you. Oh, come on. Okay, can you see the book now? Yes. Okay, so this is what it would look like. So you can see that our like, uh, Uh, sorry, I skipped, I skipped, we're not there yet. Oh yeah, we are. Did I, did I skip over the grid? No. Did I 
think it is. Oh, we aren't even there. <laughs> okay, so this is what the ROC curve looks like. So we get each of our fold, and it actually looks like a better model than the um, the the Bayes. Um, so we have our ROC is 0 .939, uh, 939, which is a little bit better than what the Bayes had returned. So when we look at the confusion matrix, this also looks a little bit better. But 0 0.01 was a little arbitrary, right? So Okay, so sorry. Here we go. Okay. Um, so point zero one is basically chosen arbitrarily. Um, so how can we figure out what would be the best value to use as our penalty measure? Um, and the way we can do that is we can actually tune our model. Um tune tune our model for the uh to get the best penalty. Sorry, my cat likes to scratch the bed. Um, so we create another specification where we get the uh, set the mode to be classification JLM net. Um, this time we pass in the tune uh, function for our penalty. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a grid of possible values for our penalty. Um, and we select 30. So that's what let me show you what that looks like since it's not in my. So basically, it's going to spit out um, using the penalty function um, thirty possible penalty values, like reasonable possible, like reasonable penalty values we can use. Um, so we can use our we can use all of this to tune our new model. So we pass in the work, uh, we initiate the workflow um, with. Uh, this tune spec, this particular tune spec that takes in the penalty um, of different values, and then use something called tune grid, where we pass in the workflow and the folds and specify the grid of all the different values for the penalty. Instead of the resampling, this that's this essentially, this is how we're going to fit the workflow to every parameter in that Lambda grid. So once that gets fit, we can now- um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So here it seems um, they are doing grid search, right? Am I correct? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so um, uh, can you go up a little bit, Halela? Yeah. So here, this um, where we okay. Can you go a little bit again? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here, where we said the penalty tune. So this tune function, what is it doing? And also, like here, when we come here to create the grid lambda the grid, we call this function penalty, and the uh, the penalty is it the one that randomly select the parameters so that we don't choose manually, like um, uh, it either it selects randomly. Do, is there any way, how does it do the selection? For example, if we want to do manual grid search, we can just specify the numbers, maybe like um, uh, select some distance. So how does it select um, the, uh, the grid search um, parameters? Oh, can I answer this actually now? Um... When you, it's the level 30 argument. So when you pass in the levels 30 into grid regular, it passes it through the Latin hypercube uh, algorithm, which I think is just a fancy word of saying, given an area, just find me like the 30 best fits that, you know, evenly spread out. So it just select random values for those penalty. And what that penalty uh, bracket does is it sets up a table with penalty as a, uh, column name, and then it has 30 rows of evenly spaced out values to try on different, uh, try on, try, yeah. try out on your model. Okay. I think that's how grid regular works. It calls it Latin hypercube. Right. So it does like automatic selection of our 
uh, parameters, right? Yeah, you can always pass in your own tibble, but I think this just spaces it out for you. Yeah, yeah. So in is it a range? Yeah. Okay, great. So the That's default true. here, I was just reading the, the help. Um, the default is a log transformation um, for uh, basically, we didn't pass anything to the penalty function. So if nothing is passed, so it, um, the default is, if nothing is provided, the default is used, which matches the units used in range, if no transformation, null. So if we look at um, grid regular, Is this also from dials? Oh my goodness. OMG. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. So random number, random and regular grids can be created for a number of parameter objects. So Yeah, you select levels and levels here is an integer for the number of values of each parameter to use. Um, oh yeah, so, so they even say you're one or more parameter objects such as m try or penalty. Um, and the levels is an integer for the number of values for, of each parameter to use to make a grid, regular grid. Levels can be a single vector or a vector of integers, same length, yada, yada. So, I think like Juan said, the it's going to spit out 30, but um, I think to answer the question, I, I think what Juan makes sense, I honestly don't know. So I will defer to him. Okay, so let's see. Let's get through this chapter uh, four. So once we have our um, tuned um, so I think I already went through this. So this is our workflow and yeah, so we're going to actually try and get the best penalty, uh, value. Um, and so we basically tune like we normally would, and we get the, met um, the metrics using collect metrics. And let me show you what that would look like. So this is what the, the tuning results would look like. So you get each of the folds, um, and then from tenfold cross validation. And then when you actually collect the metrics, you get each of the, um, for each one an accuracy and an ROC, AUC. And you can see the, um, what the values for each of them for each level of penalty. So you can see that there's 60 records. So 30 times two for, for each of these metrics. Um, so we can see how that actually, Oops, we can see actually how that looks. Um, this is the next step and it's not in my uh, R. So we can plot out each of the, um, the um, ROC and AUC for an accuracy for uh, each of the penalties to try and determine which would be the best value. But you can also call directly the show best function. So when we actually get that, those results from our tuning and pass it to show best, you can, you get the top five, um, the top five penalty values. Um, and then there is one, so you can see the, the best one here, they're all 0.953. Um, so any, technically any one of these penalty values um, but there is a way to select one out of these five using um, a method called select by one standard error. So basically the, um, the best model within one standard error of the numerically best model, as it says right here. Um, 
So we are left with the very first one, which is 0 0.00788. All right, so now that we've done that, we have to basically put the final workflow back. So we're gonna use this optimal penalty value to and pass that into our final workflow. So there's a, actually a function called finalize workflow in which we pass in the tune um, workflow and our chosen AUC value, so that 0 0.0078 or whatever. Um, and then we can fit that model, that regularized model to our training data. So we use fit function with this lasso model to our training data. And then um, now we can see which features contribute the most to a complaint being not about credit and which one being about credit basically looking at it, the results in reverse. So um, in ascending or descending order. So this is what that would look like. Um, we can see that uh, complaints about funds, appraisal, escrow, bonus. So this is more like mortgage related complaints are categorized as not being about credit. And then when you look at the results of um, in, uh, in ascending order, uh, you get reseller, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. So these are all um, complaints related to credit that are labeled as credit. All right, so we are at three o'clock. And that is only half of chapter seven. So um, the, next we're gonna talk about sparse encoding, multi-class, um, actually utilizing all the classes of product uh, instead, of instead of categorizing it into a binary variable, um, and then using custom features, uh, and then actually putting everything together for a final model. Hopefully I can get this freaking thing to knit. Um, but I just want to like also go back to the the thing, the book club. So Looks like I'll have to continue classification um, for next week. But I want to say, I want to get, I want to let you guys know that um, the 18th and the 25th, I will not be here. That's my spring break, and I'll be out of the country. Vacation? Where are you going? I'm going to London. <laughs> so um, I just want to give you guys a heads up and let you guys decide what you want to do. So that. Right. Uh, OK. Um, you know. Thank you, Mahila. Um, I think uh, <laughs> the presentation for today is like, kind of uh, concrete intensive um even though you say you have 64 gb ram is like taking time still um yeah i know do not like, try it like if you did attempt if you if you try work this chapter out yeah. <laughs> literally i would probably just do it on a thousand records or something like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. because there's also so many models that you're building in this chapter it's not like just yeah. one I so understand. this <laughs> has been knitting for has been trying to knit for almost two hours like it yeah. crashed it like it aired in in yeah. the middle of my talking so yeah as i said like when i was doing the um the chapter for all embedding also it, i just like uh, uh just slice a sample and try to do that so i think um this is a uh, something that uh, we can continue next week uh, yeah because of like there as um case studies that we can all look at. Uh, since the chapter does not have like uh, exercises that we do, but the case studies actually uh, may bring something good that we can 
see the practical way to do this stuff. Yeah, right. so, so for the sake of, um, I'm sorry, Sham, for the sake of, of length and computation, I skipped the, um, where's the book? I skipped the case, two of the case studies. So look at them at, on your own time. Um, okay, which one? Go over them. <laughs> which one? Um, I skipped uh, data censoring and non-text data, ah, 7.7 okay. 7 and 7.8. Okay. Um, and I skip and I went down to custom features because at the end of the day, um, and when we put it all together, you're going to see why you want to use custom features sometimes. So mm -hmm. I left, I, I did do that one. All right. Okay. But look at 7.7 uh, 7 and 7.8. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So I think um, that's good of. Leila, thank you very much for the presentations. And uh, Latin hypercube that will use a Latin. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm wrong. Reading the chat. <laughs> it uses expand grid, I think. You're on mute. No, I'm just I'm just reading to myself. No, I just, I just want to, yeah, we might as well straighten out now what we want to do uh, for the, the the jet set one of us. Um, so what what should we do for those two weeks? I I think we probably shouldn't do as normal because you know we've missed one of our most frequent contributors. Yeah. Should we, yeah. Should we try to set up a new time? I I, I also don't think we should just skip two weeks. Oh, I don't know. So you you actually hold on. You're just not going to be available for like two weeks. Yeah. Like I I'm not taking my computer, guys. So I won't be online. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm literally like peace. Yeah, uh, we can give. Um, I'm actually so, taking a real vacation. <laughs> okay. So, Justin, are you suggesting like we can take a vacation also for two weeks until <laughs> Leila comes back? But at the same time, uh, I get Justin's point. Like, two weeks is like kind of a long time. Okay. So, there's one alternative. So, I, I don't leave until, hold on. I have to look at my calendar. My brain is not functioning right now. I mean, don't I mean, don't disturb your calendar. Maybe we can sort it out. Um, Justin, what do you suggest? Do we take vacation as well? No, I think <laughs> I'm gonna. I, I think I'm gonna support what uh, Leila is currently figuring out. I think that's gonna be the optimal solution. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm so fine with that. Yeah. It would be basically bumping up a couple of days because I depart on the 17th, which is a Thursday. So maybe that week. Maybe if we meet, met on Wednesday and said, it would be kind of close because we would meet on Friday the 11th and then we would um, then meet again on the 16th, which is a Wednesday. Um, but that entire week afterward, unless you want to meet on Saturday, the 26th, so that way there's no interruption really. If you guys want to do that, I'm okay with that. Okay, let's discuss in the uh, Slack. Maybe if sure. we can check out yeah. calendar. I also just don't want to disrupt your entire lives. Because no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as Justin said, you are the co contributors um, so we can we, we don't want to miss you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just want to make sure that you guys feel like it's you're not doing this uh, all this effort for one person, other person. I was no, kind of, no, like, no, kind no. of <laughs> might as well just we do need, it for yourself. We need a break as well. I think we haven't had missed any session since we started this one, right? Maybe. Um, so we may need <laughs> We missed one, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because no one was All available right. one day. Okay. All but right. A, so I think we, we're, we're almost done. Then. Yeah. So, but, but I just want to say, um, I, I, so no one has signed up to present for that one what would be the, you know, bumped up one. And I can do it. Like, cause I actually was thinking about maybe presenting next Friday anyway. So in a way this is like a delay. It's like, in my mind, it's kind of like I was thinking about presenting next Friday, but now it's like, oh, I have until the next Wednesday. Okay. So it would be fine with me is what I'm saying. But we should, but in Slack we'll check out people's availability. Yeah, let, let's, let's figure it out because I'm kind of in favor of what Justin is proposing so that we don't have any um, long breaks. Otherwise you just kind of forget. Um, 
And also so we can be done with the book <laughs> and not prolong it. Um, all right, so let's do it. Okay. Let's um, look at our, let's let's figure out our timing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we can discuss um, the next week. You're finalizing the next week. Um, when you're gonna uh, finish this chapter, right? Yeah. So next week I'll finish. Yeah. So, I so better finish. Next, I'm going to finish regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> We're done with chapter seven next week. Yeah. All right. So thank you all, guys. Um, we see you next week. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.